I was going to chat to you about how we've used Jasmine and Cedar for um, a couple of our projects. Um, actually, more than a couple, but I'm just going to concentrate on a couple for today. Um, I'm from Assimilar, and I'm my name's Jane, and I'm systems engineer at Assimilar. And obviously, this has been put together with a vast group of people. Gerardo is on the call today. He's our sort of GIS EO specialist. And we've also had Bethan and Taylor. They've since left, and uh, James and Nicola and Fernando have also contributed towards this rather hefty beast of a system that we've made. So um, just in case nobody really knows who we are, just a quick, oh, hang on, page down. There we go. Um, what a similar is, we're just a um, SME based in Reading on the Reading University campus with quite a lot of people who are ex-Reading University people um, and all highly qualified. We uh, look at EO data, physical parameter retrieval, data assimilation, that kind of thing, all quite complicated stuff. Um, and it's mostly centered around environment and agriculture and climate risk and all those sorts of applications. So we get, we're taking research and development and putting it through to applied projects to give customers end users things like food security and all the rest of it. So um, that's our speciality and that's what we do um, in spades. So as part of that, we've developed something called a data cube. Everybody's got a data cube, but it's a rather special one. So we require lots of data collection for all our projects. Um, we need big hefty beasts to do this, hence it's being hosted on Jasmine. Um, we have to plot it, subset it, reproject it, resample it, all sorts of bits and bobs go on on the system. Um, we're going to mainly on this on this session just talk about a couple of the totem projects, Prize and Peatlands, but we've got things running for things like Biosuccess, which is trying to help use biopesticides to control locusts and grasshoppers and things like that. So the DataCube underpins a web application that gives them strategic and tactical information on the best times and places to use biopesticides instead of chemical pesticides. There's a coffee sustainability project, and that's to help um, growing in the post-conflict areas of Colombia um, and again it's to try the the data cube there and the data and the processing is to uh, help um, model coffee berry borer life cycles so that the farmers can be advised on the best way to control that and hence improve crop output so there's lots of these similar projects so let's go to prize which is the main reason we developed the data cube in the first place PRIZE stands for Pest Risk Information Service. See what we did there. Uh, <laughs> um, it's funded by the UK Space Agency. Um, it's a UK consortium uh, with CABI, us, CEDA, a little bit of input from King's as well. Uh, we've got national partners in Kenya, Zambia, Ghana and Malawi. So this is about food security for African developing countries. And we're trying to support smallholders' livelihoods to, so they don't lose as much uh, crop to their pests and diseases. So we've got lots of scientific algorithms provided by CABI, which then uh, munch through all the data um, to and these pest risk models to produce derived products about larval emergence and, and things like that so you end up with risk maps for a country about where a farmer should be concerned and where he's got a little bit more time and then that information goes from cabbie via our interfaces out to the farmers so that they can actually see i've got tomato stem borer or whatever it might be so how does this actually work okay so we've got maps, for example, um, shape files, which define counties in a country like Kenya, um, all the topographic information, all that kind of stuff. So we, so we sort out the GIS layering system. Then there are all the satellite data and the weather data. So TAMSAT and ERA-5 in ECMWF Operational Archive and all that sort of thing that comes in as well. CABI provides their um, uh, sort of pest databases and their scientific know-how and all this goes into this we called it here an agrimet data cube it's essentially what's a big big information store it's not just data there's all the metadata there's all the errors there's all the 
um, timings, it's all georeferenced. There's just a huge pile of information in there, which is all get atable for all this quite complicated processing that goes on. That feeds into this sort of risk modeling layer. And then you've got at the end something that the sorry, cat again, something that the farmers can understand, which is to um, forecast the pests and diseases so that they're better able to control their crops. That all gets pushed out on apps and, and web interfaces and all the rest of it. What do we end up with? Well, quite a bit of stuff. Oops, I don't know what's going on there. Hang on. Oh, goodness, hold on, it's going wrong, sorry. So we've got... Um, sort of basic stuff like temperatures, you know, two meter temperature, skin temperature, um, precipitation from Tantata or whatever, wind, relative humidity, vegetation, land cover, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The resolution depends on the product, you know, some products are at 1k, some are at 30k resolution. We've got some archives of, actually Modis is over 20 years, um, and then some of it is available really quickly <clears throat> and some of it is on delay and it rather depends on the licensing terms of the provider. And then we can derive products from that, like um, how, how well has your maize grown? That's degree days, you know, how, how long has it been warm enough for it to grow? Uh, how, lo how long has it been warm enough and wet enough for pests to grow? Uh, when did you start growing? What's the leaf wetness? And that affects things like uh, leaf pathogens, you know, how we've got various models in there to, to work out leaf wet wetness. Um, and then we've got some generations of pests coming out, maximal larval inf incidence, infection risks. So we've tried to go from basic satellite data all the way through to how many wiggly things are eating your crop um, and all the way through that. It's quite complicated. The second product is, um, is the peatlands demonstrator, which was please make three sets of MODIS data available to users and the user would like it in British National Grid, uh, in a time series and CSV files, any location or area in the UK, it's got to be really easy and long data record and, and any of you who use MODIS know this is a little bit of a challenge because MODIS data has got one file per time step binned by day, month, year on FTP servers, and you need four files to make up the UK, and it's in a sinusoidal projection. These two things don't match terribly well. So our lovely, wonderful data cube comes along, stores it, does the job, allows the people to see it at the other end. So we ingest a load of files, mosaic them, turn them into georeference TIFF files, one per month per subproduct. Uh, and then there's conversions with GDAR warp and all the rest of it. We've still got all the QA and the QC data in there. And we've provided a front end for the, the, the person to use it as well. So what's this data cube look like? So this is the thing that's hosted on uh, the Jasmine system. Uh, automatic downloaders get satellite data and metadata, turn them into cloud optimized geotiffs stick them in with a big fat database and so we know where everything is and provide an HTTP server so that the other side, you can either use Python or Jupyter Notebooks or QGIS or a REST API in interface to get the data back out. So for example, we for, for the Modis Daily Albedo, the MCD43 product, there was an 11 year data set um, and that was about 16,000 files, which we've turned into 1,300 files. So this means the access is a lot easier. Era five hourly skin temperature. Um, again, we've got 21 year data set for that. We've turned it into 252 COG files, which gives you 181,000 hourly observations, which is pretty good. So there's lots of information in there. So how have we got this on Jasmine? We've got an unmanaged chat tenancy. Um, I just took a quick shot of what we're using. We're completely up to the max on CPUs and storage. <laughs> um, haven't been able to qu use quite all the RAM we're allowed because of the configuration of the templates you're given. So what have we got? We've got three machines running. Uh, Hermes has got a couple of CPUs and eight gig of um, eight K of RAM, ten gig disk, and this is the one that does the REST API server. Jupyter web test, I don't know why we called it web test, but it's still there. Uh, and that does Jupyter notebooks. That's just two CPUs and 2K of RAM. And then Nymph is the real big beastie that's got 
eight CPUs, 32K of RAM. Um, and uh, Jasmine were really helpful when we said, we need something with a lot of beef in it. They said, that's all right, we'll make you a new template, which is extra, extra beefy. And that's the one we've got. And then we've got a whole load of um, volumes as well to store all our data. Um, we started off with one just called DataCube, and then when we got the modus, we realized we needed quite a lot more. <laughs> so archive is our sort of next one that's holding a load of extra data. So what we're trying to do is provide analysis ready data for any product that's available on CEDA. Um, and then you can you can go from you know course to high resolution, any kind of time series you want, any area you want. Um, and then we might look at sort of global scientific use cases, wildfires, et cetera, as detailed there. So how does this all this look when you want to look at it as a customer? Right, so I mentioned there's a web interface. Here's the prize web interface. This is hosted on that, uh, on Hermes, um, picture of Africa. You can look at the data from that. You can choose, this is choosing Malawi and uh, the bean fly and color coded with what the risk factors are. Um, you can also get the data. Sorry, it's a little bit smudgy, but there's a REST API. You choose what you want. That's shown on the left-hand side. I want maximal lava and incidents for this particular thing, for Kenya, for these dates. And out it pops as um, essentially text. And you can have a look at, you can actually download that and then start to manipulate it so the customers can use that. The peatlands, we made notebooks. So a couple of notebooks, compare bounding box, extract CSV gives you a list of the, all the available products that you can get from the notebook. And then you just use drop downs. You don't actually need any domain knowledge or expert knowledge to and you just click get data. Out comes a nice long series plot, which if you can imagine trying to do that from the raw data would take you quite a long time. So it's nice and easy and available. Um, Here's one where we've done it in sinusoidal. So you can see the third drop down down has got it as sinusoidal. This is British National Grid. All comes out the same. You can draw a box around, for example, Wales and see a couple of plots for um, different time steps. And again, there's a 20 year archive in here, so you can choose what you like. Um, and then we've got the other ones we've got is things like a QGIS plugin. This is getting chirps. RFE data over Ghana. So you choose what you want, plot it up. Um, and then the, the, the final thing for the really techie people is you can do it in Python, hooray. <laughs> and you just have, you import this thing called a data set, give it a license file, which obviously we give to people. You say, I'd like Modus 11, I'd like the line surface te temperature, please and it gets out all the information. This is the metadata for it. And it goes, well, I've got a British Isles tile and it goes from 2000 to 2020. And then all I do is go north, south, east, west, start, stop. And then I go get data, out it all pops. Um, that doesn't, just shows you that the data is coming out. So the caveat on this is this is set up for a quite a limited user base at the moment. We haven't really sorted out for intensive data requests, but we want to start using Dask and multiple servers to support more users. Um, and Nymph will obviously support that. So carry on hosting it on, on CEDA. Um, we already have the ability to deploy a new data cube in a Docker if we need to in a Docker container, reconstitute its database. We also plan to allow connection to external file storage using our database and virtual raster files. So they can be pointed to data that's not in our storage area. So it could be pointed directly to CEDA data storage but come through to be referenced out, which means that the um, query requests look exactly the same, just it will be slower, especially if it's larger data. Um, so that's where we're planning to go to be able to use the CEDA hosting, the Jasmine machines and the CEDA, uh, CEDA data archive. Um, that'll do me. Any questions?